hey there. Well, here I am again for the second day in a row eating lemon Oreos. I'm just riding Pete Nance's hot wave right now, and I guess it's time to update Woody Durham's classic saying, go where you go, do what you do, and uh, chew what you chew. You are Locked On Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Tuesday, February 28th, 2023, the one year anniversary of our show being on YouTube. We are within 100 subscribers of 5,000, and I cannot believe how incredibly fun this journey has been, and it's all because of all of you who are diving into this. So whether you watch on YouTube or you listen and download, thank you. I love it. And I hope that uh, whether you're a longtime listener or watcher or whether you're diving in for the first time that uh, you enjoy your time here hanging out with me, Isaac Shade, the host of the show. And I want to welcome you into Locked on Tar Heels, the only daily North Carolina show out there. As we joked off the top, very seriously, we're going to talk about Pete Nance here in a bit as part of our Four Corners recap and Shady stat of the game. I want to update you on some bubble stuff, including rooting interests for tonight, Tuesday, because that's part of, while it's maddening to be on the bubble, there's a lot of fun uh, that you can do with it as well. But first, listen, that got stressful, but hey, once again, like I've been saying for over a week now, survive and advance. All that matters is winning one game at a time, one half at a time, one four minute chunk at a time and one play at a time. Is Carolina doing that perfectly? Nope. But did they survive in advance? Yep. Notre Dame? Check. Virginia? Check. And now Florida State? Check. And it got stressful. But it's a win. 77 to 66. Carolina is now 11 and 8 in ACC place, seventh place in the conference. And uh, pending the NC State Duke result tonight, as well as Wake Forest plays tonight, Tuesday, we'll know a little bit more about Carolina standing. And then, obviously, following the Duke game on Saturday, we'll know for sure what Carolina's seed will be. But you know who I want to talk about first coming out of Carolina's victory over Florida State? Rayshon Malik Black, our guy, Leaky Black, number one. This man chose to come back to North Carolina for a fifth year. And at least part of the self-proclaimed reason to do so was that his coach and his team and his community wanted him back. And that that idea of being wanted was something that was enticing. And, and he talked about that as he made that decision. But let's face the reality. This fifth year has been rough. Not necessarily for Leakey uh, as an on-court entity. He's had, and we'll talk about the numbers here in a second, but his best statistical year by all sorts of metrics. But that pales in comparison as far as he's concerned as to team results. And so to that point, it's been a rough year for Leakey. Uh, man, I hate that for him. I wanted him to just come back and have a glorious last ride, but it's it's been another up and down struggle. But here we are now, and Carolina has done enough in these past three games we just talked about to put themselves back in position ahead of the Duke game on Saturday to maybe not yet solidify their place in the NCAA tournament with a win over Duke, but to, man, at least put them right on the precipice of doing it because here's the thing. Other teams are other bubble teams are going to take losses. So if you just keep winning, you're going to be in good shape. But so much of that, so much of these past three wins and all the wins this season are because of number one, Leaky Black. What a guy. I just like, I get emotional um, thinking about him being back and everything he's given to this program. Um, Man, what? Just a good man. This was his 152nd career game as a Tar Heel that ties Deion Thompson for the most in program history. If you read Adam Lucas's article after the game, you saw some quotes from Deion Thompson. Really cool to see that. Obviously, what that means is when Leakey steps onto the court 
for Senior Night 2.0 on Saturday against Duke. He will be the new Carolina record holder for most games played in his career. P.S. Um, it is not. You'll you'll see a couple sources say that this also ties an ACC record. Well, it had, but um, I think maybe those sources just aren't updated because Kihei Clark from Virginia actually now has played 155 games, so he is the career ACC record holder. So I, I just want to look at some of the numbers of what Leakey's doing, just to give context to what this year has been. Against Florida State on Monday night, a place where Carolina had lost three games in a row. They've broken that streak. He tied his career high with 18 points, a career high he set earlier this year. This season, he has career highs in total points, 221 points per game, 7.4. Tied for the most field goals he's made in a season, 80. He's going to break that. Uh, Most threes he's made in a season in his career, 25. Also, it's not just because he's taken a ton more, although he has taken more, but it's his best three-point shooting percentage of his career, 33.8. It's the most total rebounds he's had in a year, 192. The highest rebounding average in a single season, 6.4. It's his lowest turnover per game average, 0.9. He's one off his career high in blocks right now. He's got 25, and his career high is 26 in a season. He's going to break that. He's tied for the most steals he had in a season with 40. He's going to break that. And let me remind you, I've done this several times this year, but the thresholds keep going up. So now Leakey is the only Tar Heel in Carolina history with this combination of stats. 800 points, 700 rebounds, 300 assists, 90 blocks, 150 steals, and 70 made threes. Leaky's the only one to hit those and they're going to keep going up. We're going to establish new thresholds as this season winds its way down. It's wild to think that at most, you know, Carolina, I guess is going to play on the second day. They'll play on Wednesday. So he could have as many as uh, six in the NCAA tournament, four in the ACC tournament, was it Thursday, Friday, and one more. So he could have as many as 11 more games left in his career, but it's no more than that. Leaky Black's career is winding down, and that's crazy to think about. But the the things he's doing right now, when you think of Leaky Black, you're like, oh, man, he's a solid rebounder, but he's never been like a double-digit rebound guy. Well, Leaky has seven or more rebounds in eight of his last nine games and nine or more rebounds in six of the last nine games. Like, just... I mean, he's just doing new stuff. His his assist rate and his total assists aren't as high as they have been, but just what he's doing to contribute in in different and other ways. Oh, and by the way, it's not that he's doing that and his defense is falling apart. No, that's not suffering at all. Darren Green Jr., a great shooter for Florida State, finished the game on Monday night, one of 11 from the field, one of seven from three, and two turnovers. Oh, and perhaps best of all these two last things, Corey Alexander's on the broadcast. I'm sick and tired of hearing him talk about Leaky's height, but what he did talk about as good is that NBA draft scouts are in the building. They're watching all sorts of people, but they're watching Leaky because he's turning into a legit three and D guy that an NBA team's going to want to take a chance on. The defense has always been there, but the three point shot is coming along. Is it awesome and stellar? Nope but he can knock down that corner three. He hit a wing three, maybe two wing three. Two of his three were wing threes on Monday night. And so NBA guys are looking at Leakey. They want him. I would love to see him carve out a space for himself in the NBA. What a story that would be. But here's where we got to land this Leakey Black discussion. That dunk. Oh boy, that dunk. I hope you saw it. If not, I I shared it on my Twitter. (laughs) I have been waiting on this dunk for five years because as long and as athletic as Leaky is, I'm like, man, I just want him to throw something down that is just abusive to the rim. And this, we got it on Monday night, the most vicious slam of his career in a perfect moment. It was Florida State has gotten this lead down to four. It's like, what is going to happen? Well, Leaky Black. A, a now somewhat respected, at least you got to get out on him, three-point shooter. It's a great pump fake on Matthew Cleveland. It's a perfect pump fake. 
drives to the rim against the second high tallest team in all of division one and is like, okay, I'm going to have to dunk this. And he does. It's the perfect pump fake, perfect pump fake, the perfect finish and the perfect moment for leaky to basically put the lid on the game. Cause uh, Florida state never really pushed uh, back closer at that point. Leaky black. What a guy friends, please, please, please enjoy him while he's still here because he is just one of those do it all jack of all trades guys that Carolina has been blessed to have. Well, we have certainly other things to talk about from this game, but I just wanted to give Leaky some love. We're going to have our four corners recap and our shady stat of the game. I can't wait to share those with you in just a second. But first, this episode is brought to you by Built Bar. Are you looking for a delicious treat that's healthier than Pete Nance's lemon Oreos? Well, uh, then I have the thing for you and you got to try a Built Bar. And if you're like me, you're trying to eat a little healthier here at the beginning of the year and you want to do that without compromising taste. Well, Built Bar is the thing for you. Why is it so great? Well, in addition to being tasty and healthy, it's covered in 100% real chocolate. It comes in great flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, just a couple examples there. And by the way, even while it tastes so good, they still have great macros, 130 calories. That's not bad at all. Four grams of sugar and yet 17 grams of protein. Meanwhile, you don't have to wait around to get a, an order from Built.com anymore because you can run down to your local Walmart and get a four pack of like cookies and cream. Or if you're, you know, maybe you got a party going on and you want the bulk size, you just head on down to Sam's Club and they'll have it right there for you. Built Bar, go get you some. You won't be disappointed. A proud sponsor of the Locked On Network. All right. The Four Corners recap, for those of you who might just be tuning in for the first time, this is how we recap every game, just me pointing out four things that I thought were really important, and it's a way to remember Coach Dean Smith and that Four Corners offense. So, number one on our Four Corners recap. I said it yesterday on the show, coming off of the Virginia game. I'm going to say it again today, just like I was eating the lemon Oreos today. This version of Pete Nance makes UNC a completely different and completely better, I should specify, basketball team. If if Carolina is getting what they got from Pete Nance Saturday and again on Monday, they can legit, hear me say, they can legitimately be what they want and hope to be. This is his second dub-dub, what I call double-doubles, his second dub-dub in the last three games, had 15 points, 10 boards. He was... Interestingly, one of four heels that had 15 or more points, none of whom were named Armando Baycott, by the way. We'll get to that in just a second. In terms of points scored, it's the second highest two-game stretch of his Carolina career. Had 28 and 11 in back-to-back -back games earlier this season, but just two points off of that. Not to mention, perhaps the most important thing that Pete Nance is doing right now is he's hitting from the outside. He was 4 of 4 on Saturday, was 3 of 6 in this one, meaning he's 7 of 10 in his last two games from 3. If he's able to do that and stretch the, the defense out and create not only space for Armando, but space for driving lanes, for Leaky <laughs> getting to the rim, but chiefly uh, RJ and Caleb, that's so important. And here's an undervalued thing that maybe you've missed. Pete Nance's free throw shooting. It really started to catch on with me because I was down the stretch. Pete Nance was the one that was at the free throw line, was six of six to help close out the game. Maybe you've seen this, but Pete Nance has now hit 18 straight free throws. He is the second leading free throw shooter on this team behind only RJ Davis in terms of like guys that qualify. 82.5% on the season. Yeah. Did you realize Pete Nance was doing that? Probably not. Let me know in the comments if you did and uh, power to you. But it's interesting because while there's been a lot more Pete Nance, especially these last two games, there's not been as much Armando Baycott, or at least not together. They've started together and they've played together at other times, but we've seen extended stretches in each of the last two games where it's like just Pete playing the five and it'll be like Pete, RJ, Caleb, Leaky and Puff Johnson, or there was a stretch um, on Monday's game where it was Caleb, RJ, Seth Trimble, and I believe it was Dontrez and 
and Puff and Pete Johnson's er, Pete <laughs> Pete Nance, excuse me. Um, and then Mondo would get back in, and and some of this, let's be honest, is is foul trouble, right? Um, both Saturday and on Monday night, and and part of that is the double teams and and all of that hard stuff that that Mondo has to deal with from Virginia, and then just that sheer length of Florida State. So I think better days will be ahead against Duke, but you think about a guy like Derek Lively, there's more length there too. So. We will wait and see what happens on Saturday. But you just look strictly at the minutes played. Against Virginia, Pete had 33.50. Mondo had 24.28. Against Florida State, Pete had 36.51. Mondo had 20.51. So, again, perhaps some of that is foul trouble induced. But I'm just curious to see if we're going to see more of this shift to giving Pete more time alone at the five. Number two in our four corners recap. Turnovers. I, I, we can't say all good things. The turnovers were a plague on this game, particularly in the first half. And we'll get to the numbers of it in a second, but here's why this is such a big deal to me. I've harped on, you've heard me talk about this if you've been dialed in with us, that Carolina has put themselves in such bad positions so many times where they've had to kind of eke out games at the end. Sometimes they've done it like they did Monday against Florida State. Boy, that what a way to go that would have been if Carolina had folded. Uh, they were up four, and Florida State was pushing, had a free throw to get it to three. But anyway, um, Carolina hasn't always been able to close those games this year. But what I've consistently said is if Carolina would take care of the little things that Coach Davis is trying to get them to take care of in the first half, we've seen so many examples of that. They wouldn't have to worry about it down the stretch because they would be ahead so much. But this is exactly what we're talking about. Make it easy on yourself later in the game by taking care of things in the first half. Unfortunately, in the first half, Carolina had this stretch of like seven possessions where they turned it over on five of them, finished the first half with nine total turnovers, and committed a turnover on each of the first two possessions of the second half. That's just not going to do it. Carolina was up 18 at the half, but the, the game could have been over by halftime had they not had all those turnovers. So you finish this game with 14 turnovers. It's tied for the second most this season. Now, thankfully, okay, like let's think about what Carolina could have done in the first half without those nine turnovers. Carolina shot 54.2% in the first half, a great field goal percentage, even higher from three. We'll talk about that in a second. So of the nine turnovers, let's say you cut that down to four. That's five more shots you get. Let's say, since you're making over 50%, let's say you hit three shots of those nine turnovers that you had. And because of the percentage of what Carolina did in the first half, let's say you make two twos and a three. That's seven more points. So hypothetically, Carolina could have been up 25 instead of 18. And I, I feel like that's a conservative estimate of what they would have done. You, you with me on that? Yeah. And so just turnovers. That has to be cleaned up. That cannot stand. Four corners point number three. Thankfully, though, Carolina went wacky yet again from the three-point line in the first half. In fact, they went wackier than they did Saturday against Virginia. The onslaught. The avalanche of threes were insane, and they helped cover over some of the sins of the turnovers. And, and frankly, they, they covered over some of the sins of Carolina not doing much else well and made that first half kind of padded, right? Like, what happens in this game without that? I, I don't know that I want to consider that, but you don't have to. That's the last true road game of the season. Now all you got is Duke at home. <clears throat> and then neutral games the rest of the year. So way to go, Carolina. Fourth road victory of the season and back home in neutral the rest of the year. But Carolina, at one point in the first half, had made eight of their 13 three-point attempts and then went into halftime having made 11 of 18. That's 61.1% from three in the first half. Keep in mind, Carolina has only had two entire games in which they mo made more than 11 in the entire game. That was against the Citadel and against Clemson. And they made 11 in the first half. Wild stuff there. And, I mean, because of that, the halftime score ended up being 27 to 25. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That That's just if it was Caleb Love and RJ Davis combined. They outscored 
<laughs> they outscored uh, Florida State by themselves 27 to 25. The, the actual halftime score is 43, 25. That's exactly what the Tar Heels had to do on the road. Get out to a big lead um, that hopefully they didn't have to do what they did in the second half, but it ultimately allowed them to. But again, imagine what that halftime lead could have been without all those turnovers. And, and remember, that's without, with, without any points from Mondo, who had zero first half points, finished the game with one. Final point in our Four Corners recap, number four. You might recall on yesterday's what to watch for of this Florida State game, one of the things I said is, hey, getting a lot from the starting five and Puff Johnson, who is going to be someone else, kind of an, an extra X factor to come in and add something, whether it's somebody long and athletic because it's Florida State and Coach Davis, as you know, it uses his personnel pretty matchup dependent. And so I said, what if it's somebody like Jalen Washington, whose length uh, would be beneficial or somebody like Seth Trimble, whose athleticism would, would be a win for the Tar Heels. Well, Jalen played just shy of four minutes, so he didn't really do much, but um, Seth played nine minutes, um, didn't score, didn't do much there. But the one that I didn't really factor in that ended up playing quite a bit because of his athleticism with Dontre Styles, who played 10 minutes, contributed four points, including a three pointer. And so um, you saw coach Davis once again, being pretty personnel dependent in terms of his bench usage. Very interesting. And some of the just keep watching how he uses that bench and wrapping up this section, the shady stat of the game. Remember we're going to get to bubble talk in just a minute. So stay with us and we'll hit the shady stat of the game and then get there. You might recall that <clears throat> on yesterday's show, the shady stat of the game was just talking about that in games where Carolina has made 35% or more of their threes, they're eight and zero. Well, they did it again. They were above it. And so now we're nine and zero on the season when they make 35% or more, but here's what they did in these two games back to back for the first time all season, Carolina made 40% or more of their threes in back to back games. They had not done that all season before this game versus Virginia and this game at Florida State. Against Virginia, 10 of 22 from three, 45.5%. Against or at FSU on Monday, 14 of 29, 48.3%. Is Carolina going to be able to keep that going? That is the question because at this point, the Tar Heels are just going to be reliant on their threes and you just have to live with it. You don't, you don't love it because season long, they've not been consistent. They have been these two games, but you just don't trust it yet, right? I, I don't. I wouldn't expect you to either. But if they're going to keep shooting like this, hey, go wild. <laughs> but got to get back to Mondo. Got to get back to um, attacking, which we saw more good of that. want to see Leaky do it and Caleb and RJ as well. And per Matt Bowers, by the way, this is the first time in UNC history, this game was that four different Tar Heels made at least three three-pointers. Yeah, four different Tar Heels made three or more threes. And that was Pete, Leakey, RJ, and Caleb. Great stuff there. Way to go. If you can keep it up, knock it out. I love it. All right. We do want to do some bubble talk. I want to tell you some things that happened on Monday night that uh, helped or hurt Carolina's bubble chances, as well as what you can be watching for on Tuesday night in terms of some more bubble games to watch and who you should be cheering for in those games. We'll do that in just a second. All right, Monday night, or er, uh, we had a couple things outside of um, Carolina's game that, that we were keeping tabs on. Three specific were Oklahoma State against Baylor, West Virginia against Iowa State and Nevada against Wyoming. Carolina got the result they needed to in two of those three matchups. Oklahoma State lost to Baylor, so that's good news for Carolina because Oklahoma State's a bubble team. Iowa State at home lost to West Virginia. They had the lead and gave it away in the final two minutes. Really tough one to swallow because that means West Virginia, who has a, a decent resume. I mean, it's somewhat comparable to Carolina's is going to stay above them in uh, most bracketology you see, but then Nevada who was safely in the field, but they lost to a Wyoming team who has now just nine total wins. And so I'm curious to see where Nevada lands as things refresh on Tuesday or Wednesday. So those things, so keep your eyes on that. And in fact, 
following all of Monday night's action, Joe Lenardi didn't update his full bracket yet, but he did update the last four buys, the last four in, and the first four out. And so what all those mean, let me just remind you of those categories and what they mean. The last four buys, those four teams are in the field safely. They don't have to go to Dayton for the play-in games. They are in the main bracket already, typically in the like 9, 10, 11 ranges where those four teams would be. And then the last four in is the next group. Those four teams are the four at-large teams that go to Dayton to play in the play-in games. And then the last category is the first four out. So those would be teams just right outside of 68, 69, 70, 71, and 72. Obviously, the math is a little bit different because those teams would be above some of the automatic qualifiers, but you get my point. Um, So let's look at what those teams are right now. The last four by, so the four that are in, USC, Southern California, not South Carolina, Memphis, West Virginia, and Auburn. Last four in Mississippi State, Boise State, Wisconsin, and Arizona State. And then first four out, North Carolina moves up one slot to the top of the first four out with Oklahoma State, who took that loss right behind them, and then Clemson, and then Michigan. So I've been looking at the resume of all 12 of these schools. North Carolina and West Virginia are the only two of those 12 who don't have a quad three or quad four, quad four loss. So that's good news for the Tar Heels, but Carolina is the only of these schools that doesn't have multiple quad one wins. All the other schools have at least two quad one wins. So beating Duke on Saturday would be huge for that. Like basically like Auburn is in the last four buys. I, I don't really see why. Um, But if Carolina could get that second quad, one victory, I think they would move potential like, cause that's where you don't want to go to Dayton. You want to move up like five more slots. You want to be in that last four buys category, not in that last four. I mean, you'll take anything you can get, but ideally you'd love to get actually into the field. So that's what Carolina will be trying to do. So keep your eyes on that. I believe Lenardi will do a full bracket refresh on Tuesday. Obviously there's other bracketologists out there doing it as well. Let me give you five games to keep your eyes on tonight, Tuesday, in terms of other teams near or around the bubble and who you should be rooting for. First off, we start in our very own conference. The ACC Clemson is at Virginia, seven o'clock Eastern time on the ACC network. So I'll give you the time and the channel as well. Uh, you <clears throat> big time cheering for Virginia in this one for two reasons. One, Clemson is a bubble team currently behind North Carolina, so you want them to lose, but also you want Virginia to win because that helps Carolina's win over Virginia stay a quad one victory. It's kind of close right now to moving into quad two territory. Second game to keep your eyes on is Texas Tech at Kansas. This is at nine on ESPN. Um, Texas Tech kind of ruined their bubble chances with their loss to TCU on Saturday, but it can't hurt for them to continue losing. So you want to cheer for Kansas as painful as that may be. Third, we move out West number 18 in the nation. San Diego state is at Boise state. And you remember Boise state is just right. A couple slots ahead of the Tar Heels. They're in that last four in um, as the second team there. And so you that's at nine on CBS Sports. You really, really want uh, San Diego State to go in and beat them, like cheer hard for the Aztecs. Be a huge Aztecs fan. Uh, the last two here, this one, I just don't see it happening, but uh, South Carolina at Mississippi State. Mississippi State's a bubble team. Right now they're at the top of that last four in. And so that is nine o'clock on the SEC Network. You might find it hard to cheer for South Carolina because Gigi Jackson and all that. Also, they're terrible. But if they could get a road win at Mississippi State, that'd be great for the Tar Heels. And then finally, Fresno State at New Mexico, 1030 Eastern on FS1. New Mexico is kind of in that same thing as Texas Tech. Um, where New Mexico kind of fell off because of a kind of devastating buzzer beater loss to that same San Diego State team on Saturday. And so New Mexico is kind of out of it, but it can never hurt for them to keep losing just like Texas Tech. So cheer for Virginia, Kansas, San Diego State, South Carolina, and Fresno State. I'll post this on Twitter as well so you can keep tabs on it as well. It's weird to have to have all this bubble talk, but it's kind of, it's different and fun and intriguing. So why not? I'll keep sharing it with you each day. I'm going to give you who to be rooting for that 
night. Well, friends, that's it for today's episode of the show. And you can follow the show on Twitter at Locked on Heels. Follow me at Isaac Shade. Email the show, LockedOnTarHeels at gmail.com. Would love your nominations for Heels of the Week, both the good and the bad. As we said earlier, don't forget to subscribe to the show on YouTube. We are less than 100 shy of hitting 5,000. We've set a goal of doing that by the end of the NCAA tournament. So we've got about four weeks, <coughs> excuse me, to get there. Also, smash the like button, leave comments on your thoughts on all this bubble talk and the win over Florida State. Also, for your next listen, check out our brand new podcast, Locked on College Basketball. If you're getting excited about March Madness and everything going on with that, make sure you check out this new show, which features me and my co-host, Andy Patton. And we'll bring you everything you need to know uh, from around the world of college basketball on and off the court. You can find it on YouTube and anywhere else you get podcasts. Thanks so much for spending part of your Tuesday talking Carolina with me. I hope that you remember that it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. Until tomorrow, peace.